You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Hi, welcome to the Legal Connection Show. I'm Teddy Collins, an attorney here in Texas. Um, the uh, Legal Connection Show airs every Tuesday at noon, uh, from noon to one. And if you miss our uh, broadcast, you can catch the show on Facebook, The Legal Connection Show, or you can catch it on YouTube. Uh, and it's also The Legal Connection Show. And you can also go to IRLoneStar.com and uh, pick up any of our previous broadcasts if you don't hear the whole thing or if you want to re-listen to it on whatever topic we're talking about. And you can get us on the local FM band on at 104.5 or 106.1, again, Tuesdays at noon. Um, okay, so today we are going to talk about trust and what they are and why you should have one or why you shouldn't have one and kind of take some of the mystery out of them. Uh, but before we get into trust and, and what they are about and how you set them up and who actually needs them, they're not just for the rich, um, I wanted to go over... Uh, just uh, something really, really quick that had caught my eye and I'd been thinking about because of uh, uh, some recent items in the news. And uh, this is about the uh, bicyclist. Uh, back in, I guess it was September, uh, on September 25th, there was a uh, bicycle collision uh, in Waller County. And uh, six cyclists who were practicing for, I guess, a, a race or a marathon or, or what have you, um, were hit by a, a, a kid. And so uh, basically how the uh, I'm reading this from a news article that came up yesterday in the Chronicle it says teen driver who struck cyclist with truck charged with six felony counts. Waller District Attorney Office announces. And the reason I was following this is uh, in part because. You know, I'm very aware, and I, as most people probably are, that we have lots of cyclists here in the woodlands that are preparing for their triathlons and, and the various bike rides. We have beautiful weather for it, but we don't always have bike lanes. And even if we have bike lanes, they still are sometimes in such a large pack that, um, you know, it's kind of dangerous for them and for you. And this particular teenager had, uh, I guess they called it rolling coal, but... Uh, it's, uh, he was basically, uh, here, I'll just read the article. It says it better than I do. Uh, a 16-year-old driver was allegedly attempting to billow exhaust from his Ford Super Duty onto a group of riders training for a triathlon on Old Highway 290 in Waller County uh, when he lost control and drove his vehicle to the group, hitting six riders and hospitalizing four. The driver stopped, 16-year-old, and spoke with the responding officers but left the scene without charges or a citation, incensing the local bike advocates and spurring a war of words between the Waller District Attorney, Ethan Mathis, and Wallen, Waller Police Tree, Chief, Bill Llewellyn, over how the incident was initially handled. Uh, the Waller District Attorney's Office announced the results of its investigation, uh, which include plans to charge the teen driver with six counts of felony aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, one for each cyclist hit during the incident. Um, uh, it, basically, what happened was uh, the 16-year-old was well-connected. His uh, parents apparently had uh, some businesses out there in Waller, knew the police chief. There was some relation between the 16-year-old and uh, Waller, which is a very small uh, community, um, he was not charged and left. But these, they, in fact, they barely did any investigation at all. And the uh, the advocates for the cyclist were uh, very upset and and, uh, and I guess went on to social media and and the press to say that this was wrong. You can't just be harassing cyclists and and effectively uh, you know injure and hurt them. And, and not have any charges brought, just to slap on the wrist and ignore it. And so um, the uh, it says a legal representative for the teen texted a short respond, a response after Monday's announcement of the charges. And he said, my client and his family continue to pray for the quick recovery of the injured bikers, which is a little bit different from what he originally said, uh, wrote the defendant's lawyer, uh, Rick DeToto, who I know, and he's a really nice guy, um, 
due, and it says, due to the confidential laws surrounding juvenile cases, we have no further comment at this time. Um, because he's 16, you do not know his name. You don't know how he's well-connected. Unless you live in Walla, you probably don't know who this is. Uh, but uh, juvenile records are sealed, and juvenile cases are sealed. And they're really, really hard uh, to come by to get that information unless you have the inside track on it. And, and generally, when a juvenile is is even found guilty of a felony, they're usually not held because they don't have juveniles don't stay in jail unless they're a flight risk or they're they are danger to themselves or to the society. And so they just basically go home if they've got somebody that can take them in. If the parents don't have a household that um, is uh, safe in accordance with the uh, the juvenile court system and the advocates who will actually come out there and check it out. Um, then they go into foster care, but they usually don't keep them incarcerated unless it's some uh, a crime that's uh, a, a, a high uh, felony or they don't have a safe home. Um, I do a, a Bible study up in New Waverly for, uh, for, for children that are under 18 uh, boys that have gotten in trouble with the law. And uh, these particular teens are uh, the ones that can't be released back because there was uh, a punishment uh, to what they did that was significant. And so they're basically incorpor- incarcerated in this camp-like situation. Um, it's uh, called Gulf Coast Trade Center, and they learn a trade. And the ones, it used to be CPS and kids that were, uh, you know, basically what's considered a juvenile delinquent. You're not guilty, but you're delinquent if you're a juvenile. Um, but they're really, really nice, and I think they just had they were misguided and may not have had the home life that they needed to kind of get the right direction. So this is a really nice facility. But they go to camps at any rate. They don't go to jail. They only go to jail and are held under, uh, like, like an adult if they are certified as an adult. And um, for uh, cases like murder, uh, aggravated robbery, uh, the, uh, aggravated kidnapping, the, the more dangerous felonies than it's uh, under the circumstances of the case and how old the child is and whether they it was reasonable for the head of defense, then they are um, they're more easily certified to be an adult and are treated as though they're an adult. But um, kind of getting off the beaten track here, basically uh, this uh, juvenile, this 16-year-old, uh, basically kind of sounded like a brat to me. It didn't sound like it was just an accident. He mowed down six cyclists uh, trying to uh, antagonize them. Uh, in a rural area, which makes no sense. So he really probably needed to uh, feel a little bit of pain from that uh, because he caused pain to the cyclist. It says, Chase Farrell, a cyclist riding close to the group at the time of the collision, says he witnessed the driver attempting to, quote, roll coal or billow black smoke on the riders and admonished the teenager for his recklessness as they waited on the road for the emergency responders. Uh, It says... uh, yeah, you did something really uh, stupid, and um, and of course, you know, I can't read my printout because it cut off, but it basically said that they based, they didn't even interview the cyclists that were injured. They just um, apparently were airlifted to, uh, at least two of them, to a hospital for treatment. So it's pretty serious. I mean, there were some broken bones based on this kid's, what appears to be... Um, Highly reckless, um, moving toward knowing and intentional, in my opinion, because I've never come close to hitting somebody. I'm very aware that if there's a cyclist, you need to uh, protect them. I wouldn't want to be hit. Uh, And this kind of stems from this other cyclist that was killed, which uh, happened just last weekend. And that one uh, is is that a, uh, and I don't have the cyclist's name, but He was a cyclist that started, he was going to do a cross-country cycle uh, from uh, San Diego to St. Augustine, Florida. He was mapping um, and and keeping up on social media with how far he went each day and and what his, uh, he was put a little map on uh, on the the Facebook. And the the last, uh, uh, I guess, entry that he had on, I think it was Twitter, was a picture of his uh, journey from Navasota to uh, through the Sam Houston Forest to Cold Spring, and uh, he noted that the Texans were basically the most impolite and dangerous uh, uh, drivers to cycle around, which 
doesn't speak well for uh, Texas hospitality. But uh, the very next day, he was run over by a truck and and it killed. It says he was airlifted to a Beaumont hospital. Oh, he had gone 63 miles that on, in one day. So he goes about 10 miles an hour. Or the people he was riding with went that far. And he'd only made it about halfway through his journey. Um, you know, maybe it's more desert going through Arizona, New Mexico, and in West Texas. But he was still not going in a very populous part of Texas if he was going from Navasota through the backwoods to Cold Spring. Uh, at any rate, um, he it says... He was airlifted to a Beaumont hospital after the driver of a Ford Escape failed to maintain his speed while driving along FM 787 and collided with a group of cyclists. Uh, According to the Texas DPS, the man, 51-year-old Kent Joshua Wosepa, died of his injuries the next day. And I had followed that because it was really just heartbreaking that this guy was uh, riding across country for charity and, and, um, I don't even think he was from the United States. I think he was from Australia. Uh, but here in Texas, we've had two uh, cycle collisions within uh, an eight-week span where people were uh, seriously injured or killed. And so you need, just kind of have to be watch out for that. According to the uh, the Chronicle article, the, uh, the, the driver of the Ford Escape was also released without charges, but they're looking at... Uh, bringing charges on him because, uh, you know, again, if you see somebody riding a bike uh, and it's in broad daylight, um, you, I think that you need to be careful. And uh, and just like the commandments, you need to serve God by serving others and treat people as you would, uh, I guess, love your neighbor as you love yourself and you wouldn't want to be running to like that. Um, all right. So today's show is on trust law. And you're, I don't want you to roll your eyes back and fall over in a faint, but it was it's kind of important because uh, it's a, 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 a means of uh, a perhaps avoiding probate and be, being able to uh, use assets for good. And there's some benefits to it. And it's really not that hard to set them up. And Texas has uh, their trust code um, housed within the Texas property code. And um, it's a little bit weird. I thought it would be in the estates code, but it's not. It's in the property code. And it's within the property code. It's called the trust uh, code. So uh, here is trust 101. Why have a trust? Trusts aren't just for the wealthy or the complicated uh, rich estates. They could be very helpful for many average people too, just like you. Um, Here are the basics for trust, what they do, and how they can be used. Um, It is a well-documented fact that most people do no estate planning. And I can say that uh, right up front that I don't have a will. Um, I don't have a will because uh, my children are adults. Um, I believe that Texas, uh, uh, I want to say indigency, it's the intestate uh, laws uh, set out exactly how my estate should be distributed uh, for the property that I don't already have outside the trust. And there's many different uh, types of ways that you can uh, bypass having to probate your case in one of the uh, local county courts. And that is, um, you can put your money in uh, in a bank and you can set up an account that has a... Uh, a payable on death provision, um, you know, interest rates in banks aren't all that great. So that's why I kind of lean towards setting up a trust because you can have a trustee investing the assets within the trust uh, to get a higher return for your investment than you typically would if you've just got it sitting in a bank account. Um, you can also uh, set up uh, your uh, real property so that you retain a life estate and at but you have title to it and it, uh, upon your death that it will automatically transfer uh, to the uh, beneficiary of the life estate. Uh, and there's no need for you to probate because it's outside the probate. Um, there is, a, 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 you know, I wasn't trying to make this an estate uh, uh, planning program, but you can also um, set up uh, your 401ks and, you can set up uh, like TD Ameritrade where you've got your assets I- invested in these other various accounts that will uh, pass outside of the necessity of probate 
directly, so they're non-probate assets. So um, uh, that being said, there's other ways that you can estate plan uh, or plan your estate so that you don't need a will, or even if you had a will, it would be unnecessary for you to actually probate it. But um, today we're talking about trust because this is a really um, simple method, uh, I-, I believe, if you set it up properly, to uh, pass your assets along, whether it be for uh, charity or for your heirs, uh, to get some good tax breaks and to have to bypass the immediate need to uh, get, get into probate. And again, if you set up a bank account, my father had done this, if you set up a bank account and you share it uh, and, and you have set up a, a, as a joint account with rights of survivorship, that's another means of bypassing the need to have a will and have it probated. That's really a, a, a risky way to uh, plan your estate, though, because if your entire account is going to go to just one sibling or one child that is the person that has um, the rights, um, uh, the joint account, is the cosigner to the account, uh, then the money that went in that you put into it automatically goes to this one person that's the signer. And that may not have been what you wanted. You may have wanted it to, to be distributed equally between all your kids and you're gone. And there's nothing in the law that says that the person that is now the holder of that money um, has to distribute it to equally to all of your children or grandchildren if you want to have a generation skipping type setup. That's the beauty of a trust is uh, the trust will prevent um, one person from controlling uh, the, the, all the money at, at the instant of death, like in a bank account with um, joint rights for survivorship. Okay. Um, of those that set up a trust, the majority use a last will to pass their estate to it to spouse or divide it amongst their children. So you can actually set up a will that's got a trust uh, provision in it that allows for the bulk of your property to immediately pass to a trust or to go to your spouse. But then you still have to go through probate. But um, I've set up a lot of those um, with estate planning. Um, I, I still don't think they're as, as effective as being able to handle um, your trust assets while you're alive and not relying upon a will which could get lost or not probated so your wishes wouldn't be handled properly. All right, so what is a trust? A, a trust is an agreement. Uh, we're going to boil it down to the very simplest ele- es- uh, elements. It is an agreement between two parties, a settler, a settler, not like a settler of the United States, but S-E-T-T-L-O-R, and a trustee. The person that owns the property is the person that's settling. The trustee is the person that you are um, uh, asking to manage and administer the trust. The trustee can be a bank. It can be a good friend. It can be uh, a beneficiary. Um, It it can be a number of different people. But um, I like the idea of having more than one person that's handling the trust. So you've got sort of a... Uh, checks and balances kind of thing. So you can have co-trustees. At any rate, although trust may be used for many other purposes, um, for our discussion here, the trustee agrees to accept, manage, and protect the assets delivered by the settler. Uh, the uh, administer To administer those assets according to the trust instructions and distribute the trust income and our principal as the trust allows only for the benefit of the people identified in the trust. So you've got a settler, the person that has the property, the trustee, who, which can be one or more people, that's managing the trust, and then the beneficiaries, who are the people that are ultimately who the trust is set up for. The beneficiaries can be a charity. It can be your children. It can be your cat. um, It can be um, even yourself in part. You just can't be the settler and the beneficiary. You wouldn't have a trust. All right. The trustee is a fiduciary. Um, I usually think of a fiduciary as a verb, but basically that means that um, as a fiduciary, the trustee must act with reasonable care in administering the trust and selecting trust investments, avoid any conflict of interest or self-dealing in holding, purchasing, and settling the trust assets, and diligently avoiding breaching any of the trustees' many duties to the settler and the trust beneficiaries. So there's a lot of duties that the trustee has. And, you know, this comes to mind, um, uh, I think of uh, 
the Britney Spears situation where her father was her, um, uh, not her, uh, I guess he was a trustee. Um, I'm not sure how it, uh, sir, uh, he, he was what? Thank you. Conservator. Yes. The conservators got similar fiduciary duties to a trustee in that they need to manage the state with reasonable care, uh, select trust investments. They have to avoid conflict of interest. But but yes, thank you. Station Manager Dick, I'm kind of losing my mind. I said wasn't didn't really read it beforehand, but he was a conservator. But he uh, and we're not getting into conservator law, but. Uh, as uh, the court uh, saw in that case, you know, that was kind of out of control. She uh, certainly was competent to handle her estate after her initial sort of uh, crazy moment. And you can voluntarily ask somebody to be your conservator, but this was not voluntary at this point. She had given up her rights, and he was um, sort of out of control with her millions of dollars. And clearly, uh, it looks like she wasn't interested in in fame and fortune anymore. She already made her fortune. It looks like she just wanted to relax and have her life. Time will tell what's going on with that. I mean, the very next day after he is removed as her conservator and uh, uh, I guess the uh, corporate bank trustees were put in uh, his place, and I'm not quite sure who replaced him, uh, she posts pictures of herself, you know, nude with little stars and stuff, which is a little bit crazy, but maybe it was kind of an interface to her dad or something. But at any rate, I don't know if that was actually necessary. It looked like an emotional reaction and sort of gave credence to maybe she still needed some supervision. But uh, that being said, uh, they, there's a similar fiduciary duty between conservators and trustees for a trust, although not, they are not exactly the same. And if you um, have a, a bad seed, and this is just a little bit off the beaten track for our discussion today, but if you have a kid that's out of control, that is a minor, this happened, I get these calls all the time where a, a, a child is... Um, uh, basically using the law as a sword instead of a uh, a, a protective measure uh, or as a, a I forgot what the, the term is but but basically these kids are very savvy and they are uh, they've got a foster uh, parent or a step parent that they if they don't get their way they're claiming that they are injured that they are being sexually assaulted. Um, they are asserting against the parent that is the one that's got the managing right uh, or the right to determine where they live and is the, you know, the a joint managing conservative with right uh, to uh, to the main rights to it, the main conservator. Um, they're threatening them if they don't get their way to uh, basically say that they're being assaulted or they're sold from them or they're bad parents or, you know, a litany of other things. And so uh, you get, I get these calls saying, what do I do? And uh, you know, it's really, really difficult because, uh, you know, the only thing I'm going to tell them is that they need to document everything, have somebody around all the time, have cameras rolling, because these kids, uh, the minute they make the allegation that they're, uh, th there's a sexual assault or there is, um, uh, they're, they're breaching duties that are due the child, um, then, um, then that's when th the people that contact me are saying, how can I get them to be, to be declared incompetent so we can have some control they're they're stealing they are um they are taking drugs they're smoking pot they're uh, a bad influence on other children in the household uh usually this happens if you've got a stepchild or maybe a foster child but uh, or maybe even an adoptive child they're out of control though and it's difficult if you it's hard to prove that uh, somebody that's pretty savvy about what they're doing and intentionally wreaking havoc on a family or even you, it, it's difficult to prove that they're incompetent. Um, uh, I have had uh, 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 situations where I've had to have one of my clients declared incompetent to prevent them from going to prison. Uh, and and the, the reason is because if the, um, uh, the prosecutor or the state's attorney uh, will align themselves with me as a defense attorney that the reason that they have done uh, some things that are against the law, whether it be, you know, evading arrest on a high-speed chase or, 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 you know, whatever litany of things are happening that they're doing that are against the law, a lot of times these felonies, um, they can't win because they really did them. And the only 
uh, but they seem extremely competent and they're out of control. Their parents can't keep the, the keys out of their hand for them to keep doing, you know, going out and drinking in the middle of the night and doing the things. Uh, uh, for girls, they're leaving and going to their boyfriend's house and running away. And for boys, a lot of time, they're taking the keys and drinking and running into houses and, you know, trying to break into ATMs or doing bad things because their brains aren't right or something. But uh, when I'm talking to them, they're really sweet kids, which may just be the the show to, because they're representing me and they're, that's how they manipulate. But at any rate, I had to have one uh, kid, well, I've had a couple of them, but one that's coming to mind, I had to have him declared incompetent. And he did so voluntarily because he was facing, um, you know, a number of years in prison for uh, crimes that didn't hurt other people, that, but that hurt himself. And um, so we had him declared incompetent. And it was a good thing because he got the help that he needed. He was... Um, uh, his mom had him voluntarily committed so that he could have counseling and detox and the various other things that he needed. And uh, now he's better. But it is a strategy that uh, many attorneys uh, use uh, to have a, a child uh, uh, voluntarily declare that they need a ward or are, are incompetent for the purpose of preventing them from going to prison. So they have a prison of their choice. It is, you know, being a ward or having an ankle, ankle honor, but they're not under the uh, watchful eye of a, a a jailer or the prison system, and they have a clean record when they do that. So, um, so anyway, um, kind of getting back on to trust, um, the uh, trustee owes a duty of obedience to follow the trust terms, a duty of prudence and reasonableness in making investment and administrative decisions, a duty of objectivity in not giving preference to any beneficiary over equally situated beneficiaries. This happens a lot in trusts that are set up um, when wills, uh, trusts are set up in wills. The estate goes into a trust after someone dies. There's a number of siblings. Um, of those siblings, maybe two are trustees. Let's say it's the two oldest daughters. Um, and they think their younger, their two younger brothers, which are adults now, um, don't make good decisions or maybe they j are just greedy. And so they're taking the estate trust money and they're putting it into their um, uh, creating a hair salon that they will run and uh, receive the, uh, the lion's share of the benefit of the profits. Uh, whereas the two boys, let's say they want to open an auto uh, repair shop, uh, but the trustees are controlling it. And uh, if the if all things being equal, the auto repair shop would make more money uh, because, let's say, they were skilled auto mechanics and the girls had no, uh, didn't have any idea what they were doing with the beauty shop, then that would be a case where uh, the, the beneficiaries could go to court and say that there was a misuse of funds or they were favoring one beneficiary or the other. And that's kind of a loose example. Uh, a better example is when a the beneficiaries are literally uh, depleting the trust, buying all kinds of things for themselves and not investing the uh, the trust assets into um, uh, something that would generate income or would be more prudent for the trust or for the benefit uh, of what the purpose of the trust was. So um, if they uh, uh, are not, are they giving preference to themselves, the beneficiary or to some other one, that's another fiduciary breach. A duty, um, a trustee also has a duty of transparency in providing trust information and accountings as, provide, as prescribed by the trust agreement, and that's generally going to be to the trust beneficiaries. Now, trust can be established for a number of reasons, among them to manage and control spending and investments to protect beneficiaries from poor judgment and waste. That kind of goes toward the conservatorship uh, situation, too. Uh, the argument was that Britney Spears couldn't manage her investment, so she, her dad was going to do it for her. He may or may not have been doing it better than a bank. Uh, I don't know that he had the education and income to do that. Uh, uh, so I think all in all, it was probably uh, not uh, in her best interest to have her father handling all of her funds when there may have been somebody that may have been a better uh, investment advisor than him. Um, another reason is to avoid court-supervised probate of trust assets and be private. And I'll give an example of that. I was recently handling a probate case, and um, the uh, the way uh, this, uh, if you've got in a, a dependent administration, then the court has full control over asking for an accounting to the penny of where 
all the money came in and where it went and how it's accounted for. And you've got to uh, provide this accounting to the court to approve. If you have an independent administration, and uh, that example is if uh, there's a will and uh, in the will it says, I uh, do not want the court to, uh, I don't want my estate to be dependent on the court. I want it to be independent and I'm going to appoint uh, this person to be my independent administrator so the court will not get involved in my business. Um, in the particular case I was handling, the court uh, didn't, and it was county court uh, two over here, the uh, the probate administrator for the court, I guess, didn't understand that we had an independent administration and was demanding an accounting, which is really costly. And when you're dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get down to the penny and uh, the court administrator uh, uh, we had ended up settling out this uh, uh, a, 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 dis, a legal dispute between the uh, the heirs and the estate, so we d- so that we wouldn't have to go through a costly administration that was going to require you know subpoenas to all of the uh, the different um, uh, the vendors that were uh, were were. Uh, we, that were being paid to maintain some real property that was owned by the estate. And so we settled out to avoid, you know, an additional like twenty five to $50,000 in legal and administrative cost. But when we presented this to the court saying we've settled, the court uh, would not approve it. They said, no, you can't do that. And after, uh, you know, basically a lot of argument because we didn't understand why the court was demanding that we have an accounting when all the parties had settled in an independent administration – they had believed uh, the 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 probate administrator of this court believed that it was a dependent estate, and that they had last say. And so, if you have an independent administration or a trust that doesn't require court supervision, then you don't. The court has no say in it, which is what you want. You don't want the court to have a say in uh, controlling whether your money uh, needs. Uh, will allow the court to appoint coming out of your pocket uh, an ad litem, uh, 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 an attorney, uh, which is, uh, I guess an attorney ad litem uh, for the estate. You would have to have that if you had a child because they'll always appoint that. Uh, an, an accountant, a CPA, and the various other things that are needed for accounting. So uh, at, at, at all costs, you want to try to keep the court um, from uh, – you want to make sure that you've got an independent administration, if possible, so that the court is not controlling uh, what you do. You have the, the control is left with the trustee or uh, with the, uh, uh, the with whoever, uh, the conservator and what have you. Now, what comes to mind is when you've got a, a, a rogue independent administrator or trustee, you may go to the court and ask them to appoint a a uh, cons- in, in the, basically it's the same thing a conservator uh, to handle the estate uh, because you prefer the court over a, a bad actor that's currently the one administrating it. But if you can find somebody to substitute in as opposed to the court, then do that. You're going to save yourself a lot of money and hassles. Um, okay, so. Um, a, a, another reason for trust is to protect trust assets from the beneficiaries' creditors. If you've got a trust and you've got beneficiaries that are down on their luck, um, they haven't paid, let's say, their uh, their their loans, um, uh, student loans. Uh, they've got uh, they they've got a uh, they're in bankruptcy, and the bankrupt estate is coming after their. Um, the, the assets that they inherited through a will are, you know, are, are, are the like, but they, they, own it, they own assets individually. If you create a trust uh, for maybe a child that can't be trusted with money because maybe they're a drug addict, a drug addict or they have a spouse that that's, they, they don't have any control over that's spending all of it or the bad stepchild or whatever, then a trust is perfect situation to protect that because the trust is a... Uh, a legal entity that can't be uh, breached by a bankruptcy. Well, not all of them, but I'm just saying this generically, uh, can't be breached by the creditors of a beneficiary. Um, you've got a timing issue on when it was set up and when they held it, and you can't you can't fraudulently tr- a, a 
beneficiary that owes money can't fraudulently transfer their estate into a trust to avoid paying their creditors if they've are if the creditors have a a senior lien. But uh, but in general, if you're a parent or you are a a uh, or you're aware that there is a a grandchild or a potential beneficiary that. Uh, uh, or is a child is is a minor, and they do this a lot of times with car accidents. The court will put uh, the money into a trust to be handled. Then, then the trust is the perfect thing to uh, protect the beneficiary from creditors, and um, if they are not at the uh, age of majority for somebody to enter contracts for them, what have you. All right. Another reason is protect premarital assets from division between divorcing spouses. So you can also set up a trust uh, just exactly as what happened with Anna Nicole Smith. Um, She married um, J. Howard, was it Howard? G. G. Howard Marshall. His son was savvy to his dad's propensity for uh, dating younger strippers uh, and giving them all of his... uh, uh, the, his the son, uh, I guess it was G. Howard Marshall II, and then the other son who was helping him run the, the oil companies that they had. Um, and so rather than allow his aged father's estate to go to uh, then uh, stripper and then future Playmate of the Year, Anna Nicole Smith, uh, who uh, was also known as, I believe, Vicki, her name might have been Vicki Marshall, Vicki Smith and then Vicki Marshall. Anyway, um, the elder son uh, had his father uh, move all of his father's uh, assets into a trust. Uh, later, it was argued by Anna Nicole Smith's lawyers that he was incompetent to make that decision. Uh, but uh, the bankers and the people that were handling this said, uh, I guess their argument was a, a better argument that he was. it was more incompetent for him to uh, marry a stripper at the age of 89, who was 26 years old, who uh, was rarely around. So um, anyway, the sons put the father's uh, interest uh, with the father's uh, consent, they did it properly with all their lawyers, into a trust, and that prevented Anna Nicole Smith from inheriting, I guess it might have been, I don't know, $500 million, $400 million. I, I can't remember the amount, but it was a significant amount of money. All right, so to protect premarital assets, um, they, a, money can go into a trust. Now, that doesn't prevent the money that's earned during the um, during the marriage, the new marriage, to be the income to be uh, recognized as uh, in Texas uh, to be owned half by the spouse because we've got a um, – uh, a uh, the community interest state, so an income that's earned by one spouse to the other is owned 50-50 by the two spouses during the marriage. Um, if the income is earned by the trust, though, uh, then it will go into the trust account, depending on how the trust is set up. Um, it Still, uh, J. Howard Marshall, uh, a lot of his income was going to go directly to him uh, because he, he had certain income that went directly to him. I don't know how that was set up. I'd have to look at all those files, which you can, too, if you're actually interested in that. If you go to the uh, 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 G. Howard Marshall and uh, Vicki Marshall probate case in Harris County, you can just uh, literally go into those files. It's all a public record. You can see how they set up all the trust, and that's might be kind of informative and educational if you want to go that direction without hiring an attorney. Now, another reason for a trust is to manage closely held business assets for planned business succession. So um, you may um, have business assets with a partner and you've got a new business that you're planning. And so you want to create a trust to uh, transfer the trust assets from one business or a trust or a partnership into a, another business to uh, create another business opportunity, which is just uh, uh, another, um, uh, if if it's a, a prudent business move and you've uh, discussed this with a, a, your uh, an estate attorney or an accountant or both, usually it's both, uh, then that's done uh, quite a bit, I think, with uh, people that have got lots of money with uh that they don't know what to do with. But normally in these kind of situations, it, they're moving it to a situation where there can be a charity like, um, um, who did that? Uh, 
I was just watching an American Built series, which is amazing. You want to watch this on, I believe it's uh, Fox Business. Uh, they have a series that uh, Stuart Varney narrates. It is fascinating. And um, they uh, they were talking about, oh, Carnegie, how Andrew Carnegie, he uh, set up tr uh, trust in his will so that all of his money, which was significant, uh, went into a charitable trust to uh, fund Carnegie Hall and uh uh, this is how you get the scholarship money and various other things. But he didn't transfer his money, uh, and neither did Getty for that, uh, uh, Getty Oils, Getty. Neither did he. All of these really, really rich men, and I think Rockefeller was another one, they transfer their money not to their heirs but into a trust for charity. And then their names live on forevermore uh, uh, because everything they do is the, the benefactors are the charities, and those can get out, kind of get out of hand, too. Um, uh, if you get a bank that's uh, not operating the trust properly, uh, and then you've, and it's an old trust, and you don't have anybody living anymore to really monitor where the money's going. Um, but I'm off the beaten track again. Um, another reason to set up a trust is to hold life insurance policies, uh, pay premiums, and collect the tax-free proceeds to care for beneficiaries, fund closely held stock redemptions or purchases, and provide liquidity to the estate. So um, you may want to, and this may be, uh, it, I may be jumping ahead to talk about this, but it may be that you need, you want to fund or, or help in a generation skipping um, uh, a strategy. You want to uh, you want the trust corpus not to be distributed, but the income to be distributed when a grandchild or, or a child reaches a certain age, and then at that point, that was kind of like what happened with uh, uh, Elvis Presley. Um, my understanding is that their uh, Priscilla Presley and his daughter can't remember her name. I'm, I'm going to lose it again. Um, I believe when she turned either 25 or 35 is when she came into the. Uh, corpus of the estate until then it was held in trust because she just wasn't mature enough to to take that much money and to um, to wisely spend it and I spend it all at once and you hear about that happening all the time when you don't earn the money then you don't really cherish it like you would or like the person that earned it and so wise parents and uh, settlers put their money in trust so that kids and grandkids and future uh, uh, descendants can't get their hands on it, or it's d doled out in a certain way so it doesn't go, it's not given to them all at once so that they can uh, benefit from tax, uh, uh, the, the tax laws and what have you. And I think if I was doing the lotto, the first thing you'd want to do would be to set up a trust. Uh, of course, you're going to, it wasn't a trust initially, so you're going to have all the taxes you're going to pay on that. But you may want to do that until you had the the benefit of getting a an estate planner and a CPA and, and, and all of the professionals that know what to do with your money to show you the best way to distribute that. And also uh, so that it's not held out to you in case uh, so all your creditors come after you uh, because that money, depending on I guess how you transfer it, could jump and not go to your account but go into a trust so that it would be able to, you'd be able to avoid those creditors. Now, um, I don't know if you won the lot of you really care because you have so much money you wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, the, another uh, thing, the reason to set up a trust is to provide a vehicle for charitable gifting that can include uh, and reduce um, income taxes. I'm sorry, not include, but reduce income taxes and benefit the settler, his or her spouse, and their children. So if you set up a charitable uh, trust and it's, you're still alive, you can still benefit by it as the settler. Uh, because the charity is uh, the way Texas laws are set up for charities, um, only has to receive 10% of the income um, from a, a charitable trust or a charity. That other 90% can be pocketed or used for charitable purposes. So uh, charities are amazing. And I think when you give, you get back tenfold. But the way the Texas laws are set out, at least the, and I know, I'm not an expert on trust law, but you only, in order to com, uh, comply with the statutory guidelines, if you set up a charitable trust, only 10% has to go toward that charity. And the other 90% can go toward other things, if you know what I mean, like maybe your pocketbook. Um, okay, so another um, 
And I'm not saying all charities do that. A lot of charities like United Way, I believe with United Way, maybe it's not United Way, they go 100% to the charity. Uh, but you got to be careful about charities. And so you really want to look into what percentage goes actually charity if you do decide you're going to give money. So do your homework before you start giving to charities too, or charitable trust. Um, all right. Uh, and that goes for uh, funding on uh, GoFundMe and that thing too, because you just really don't know what you're giving to unless you do the research. Um, okay. Another reason to set up a trust is to provide tools for Medicaid and a means-tested benefit eligibility for the settler, a surviving spouse, or disabled children. So in other words, if you are disabled um, or if you are elderly and uh, you, uh, let's say you've got a lot of assets, but you won't qualify, uh, but you, you may live another 40 years with a disability. If you go to an estate planner, they can help you set up a trust to be able to qualify for the Medicaid and, and, it, uh, and I guess get around it in that way that you're not giving all of your funds that could be used to create income to fund your lifestyle or a lower lifestyle for the rest of your life, then um, instead uh, the, your assets won't be depleted just for living for like a year. Instead, they could be invested and you could live off the income of that asset or to some degree uh, do that. The, um, that made me think of a recent case where uh, Randy Sorrell uh, was up against Rusty Harden where a, uh, an airline employee, and it was called the airport uh, employee something, but they're the people that fuel the planes and they, I think there's a union. And there was a fueler for United Airlines who uh, was within his, the white line fueling the plane. And there was another employee of this, I guess, union within the airport who was transporting baggage or, or something. And it was somebody caught it on a video or was within the security video when I was watching this trial. Um, the baggage handler, the person in the little cart, uh, mowed down the fueler who was within or on the border of the white line. And the uh, airline fueler became a paraplegic. And he had worked for some time for the uh, Houston Intercontinental Airport system. And uh, so he, the the driver of the, 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 the car that mowed him down settled out of court, probably through his insurance or some liability scheme or something, or not liability, but, but whatever it was, he settled out with them because he would, I mean, it was, it was an accident you could see on this, but Still, the person that became paraplegic was doing his job. So, uh, and I don't know where the arguments were with the settlement, but but ultimately, the um, the uh, I guess personal injury attorney, and that's what they do for a living. Randy Sorrells sued the airport system and the airport, and I think it might have been United. It was a litany of people, but they had already settled out with the driver for the pain and suffering and future, uh, and, and future earnings of this man that is was now paraplegic but but survived the hit and um it was uh it just came out like a, about two weeks ago that it was the uh the largest award i don't know if it was ever for this law firm but this man who didn't have a brain injury could still work but he was a paraplegic got 372 million from this jury and um that was uh you know, uh, Randy Sorrells must be jumping for joy. Rusty Harden represented the airport. And um, it was uh, crazy because, uh, you know, um, personal injury attorneys uh, get a uh, contingency fee. So if his contingency fee is like the ones that, you know, I'm familiar with, he would have received uh, between a third plus expenses uh, to 50%. So that is really significant. That is going straight to the appellate court. This man may never see anything until he is well gone because it's going to be in the appellate court for so long. More than likely, this will settle out of court and he'll get probably something that's a little bit more uh, palatable. But when those kind of settlements hit for something as outrageous as that, the people that are hurt are you and me as the people that fly using the airport because it increases our cost to purchase Air, uh, because the insurance goes up for the airport, it's going to increase our cost to fly. And we are already hit with exorbitant um, uh, fees because of the oil and gas prices going up because of, uh, in part, the Biden administration, uh, Russia not 
you know, the, the supply and dem- demand, uh, Biden administration, the Arabs, and various other things that are uh, creating a, a really bad situation, I guess climate change or whatever, uh, with the amount of oil and gas that is available to us right now. Um, it seems like I was paying $4 a gallon in Houston for regular, and uh, up here in Conroe, it was like, 250. So we're in a better place up here in the Willis and Conroe than they are in downtown Houston. Of course, I was at a a, a pump that was uh, for those people that are running out of gas in downtown and you're crawling along on fumes. And so they had me in a place where I was stuck having to pay $4 a gallon. All right. Another reason to set up a trust is to provide structured income to a surviving spouse that protects trust assets for the descendants if the spouse remarries. And so um, basically this is a happy second, third, fourth with their marriage. The person that is setting up the trust is the one that's making the money, controlling the income, already has assets going into it. And they love their second marriage. It may be a marriage that's lasted up to 40 years, like Casey Kasem is one that comes to mind. He was married for 40 years to um, his second wife. Um, but the kids from his first and second marriage, I think she was maybe third wife, um, were very, very unhappy with um, with with uh, the uh, the way that his new wife was managing things, and they definitely didn't want her to inherit any money. And so uh, their argument, though, was over his conservatorship in, um, in, while he was alive, making his life basically a living hell because— she, the mom wanted to take care of him. The kids wanted to move him out from under her care so that they could manipulate him and uh, or unduly influence him to change his will to cut the wife out or to set up a trust. And he was really, I think he was coherent, but he didn't want to do that. He really loved his wife. Ultimately, he died before anything was changed, and the lawsuit went forward. It was really, really, really bad. But if he had to set up a trust uh, situation where uh, during... Uh, it, the, his trust assets would go to his kids, but during his wife's uh, third wife or current wife, the 40-year wife's lifetime, she would be able to control the trust assets to a certain degree. That would have been the way to go to avoid all of the legal drama that they were going through. Um, another reason is to reduce income taxes or shelter assets from estate and transfer taxes. Um, that was the main reason that I thought people set up trust, but there's obviously, from what we discussed, many other reasons for doing it. Now, structuring trust. Trust may be structured to achieve your specific goals while providing tools for the trustee to balance those goals with prevailing investment and economic factors. The first step is to determine whether you will fund a trust now, make periodic trust over a period of time um, to the trust, or wait to trust uh, to fund it at your death. Um uh, what I want to say, because I was just uh, t- t- told by Station Manager Dick that we're running out of time again, that um, in order to uh, for, for a trust to exist, and this is going to be kind of a bare bones kind of trust 101, for a trust to exist, there has to be assets in the trust, in the corpus. It can be $1, and you can add later to the trust, depending on what the uh, the terms of the trust are and the, ben- the the purpose of the trust and who the beneficiaries are. But it can be $1 and you can add to it from another trust or a partnership or what have you. But you have to have a corpus for the trust to exist. The trust has a trustee. So the settler is the person that's putting the, inf- the, the assets into the trust. You cannot have a trust in Texas unless the settler signs off on the trust agreement. Um, uh, you could have an oral trust. You have to be able to prove it. But if the settler doesn't sign off on it because we had a, a recent case that I handled and we were in court to prove that the trust did not exist. There was a, a son who was trying to unduly influence his mother. Uh, he wanted control over her million dollar estate. So he created a, a power of attorney that he believed showed that she lost when she lost capacity when she because she was sick she had cancer that he would have control over establishing a trust the trust would move into his control and this is what he did and then he used the trust to prevent all the other uh, the other two brothers from being able to have any assets from the mother's estate we were able to prove that the trust did not exist because during her lifetime she did not sign the trust and it was not her intent. So um, I'm being told by Station Manager Dick that I have to wind it up. Um, We're going to talk about um, next week, we're going to make it Trust 101 Part 2 about how um, only certain people have access to the trust. They are not uh, filed of record. They are very private of their family trust. Only certain people can actually 
sue a trust, people that have an interest in the trust, and various other things that you need to know. You need to set up a trust, and this is why trusts are really, really a beautiful thing for people that have some assets and um, are your parents, family, spouse, have some assets, and you need to uh, be able to um, have some control over them and have the most the wisest and most prudent investments for them in your lifetime for investment planning and estate planning. All right, so uh, we will talk to you next week. Um, uh, trust uh, 101 Part 2. And remember, the most important thing that you can do during this week is to uh, serve God by serving others. And we'll see you next week.